Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to be continuing our look at the boundaries of freedom as American expansionism impacts minority groups. So let's get started. Following the Civil War, we see that most freed African Americans in the South continue to work in the range of agriculture as sharecroppers. Now, sharecropping was not limited exclusively to African Americans, but they did make up the large percentage of those people doing this. Uh, this is a system in which a person rented the land, rented the tools, rented the seed, rented the housing on the land, but did not actually own any of it. And these systems were put in place shortly after the Civil War came to a conclusion with large plantation owners who still wanted to control the resources that they did. And the uh, there were people who stayed in this system for a long time, like into the 20th century. Our first group of migrants who leave the South as African-Americans to go other places would be led by Benjamin Singleton in 1879. And they left to Kansas for because the conditions in the South had gotten as bad in some cases as slavery was. For example, if you didn't have a, if you were a sharecropper and you didn't have a system to rent at, you could be found as a vagrant and put in prison. A lot of these migrants are referred to as the exodusters in referencing either the Christian Old Testament book of Exodus or the scroll from the Torah of Exodus, also the slaves being led out of Egypt by Moses. From the federal perspective, we see there really is very little uh, effort that's offered to support African-Americans following reconstruction. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau would set up some schools that would establish and fix some problems, but by and large, a lot of these peoples are on their own. We see that opportunities for African Americans had kind of appeared immediately at the end of Recon at the end of the Civil War, but by the end of Reconstruction, they started to slowly fade away. The number of people who are African American congressmen decreases, and the African American women activist groups also start to be less impactful. And this isn't just people who are running for office. This is just citizens who are looking to vote. The first state that's going to start passing legislation against people voting is going to be Mississippi in the 1890s. And these ranged from poll taxes where you had to pay to vote, literacy tests that were almost designed for the person taking it to fail. It didn't matter if you were white or black, it was just almost impossible to comprehend as it was. A uh, grandfather clause that first said if you were, a, if your grandfather was a slave in 1865, you couldn't vote. And then when there were fewer and fewer people who that affected, the grandfather clause was moved to 1850. And all of this really resulted <clears throat> and culminated in the number of people who voted. And in Louisiana, we have a real number. In 1896, 130,000 African-Americans voted. But four years later, that number decreases to only 5,000 persons. The 13th Amendment did grant the end of slavery, except in the conditions of Sorry, 13th Amendment did grant the end of slavery, except in regards to being a prisoner. So we see that some prison systems are going to have slave-like conditions as well. During the end of the 19th century, we see some civil rights case designed for minorities start to appear. The civil rights case of 1875 grants equal treatment to all persons in public accommodations, so hotels, 
lobbies, theaters, that kind of thing, transportation, cars, steamboats, trains, and finally jury service. And that was the law of the land for the next eight years until those cases were ultimately declared unconstitutional in 1883 <clears throat> because the argument was made, the private businesses that owned the theaters, the hotels, the trains, the steamboats, the everything could decide how they wanted to proceed. And that was the justification to allow some people service and some people not service. The final real definitive civil right case to know from this time about minority rights is going to be the Plessy v. Ferguson case of 1896. And it said that the it was legal to segregate people based on race just so long as each separate group received equal treatment, equal quality of service. And with the stroke of the pen in 1896, the Supreme Court would grant the ability to segregate for well, the next seven decades. And it was really easy to separate these groups, but not so easy to make them equal. We see there's a stark contrast in quality as you would imagine. We see that African-American communities really start to adhere to these uh, ideas of separatism, and in some cases, militant separatism very quickly. Uh, some African-Americans even see segregation and they take advantage of this to fill a niche in their communities. Uh, services like, um, stores or barbers could decide they're going to cut hair or only sell to white people. And if you were an African-American person in that community, you might not have a place to, to do business with. And African-American people in those communities usually created their own business to do stuff at, to make money for to fill the need for their own communities and of course as you can imagine there were some whites who found you know a great angry and vitriol in this over time we see that there's a really complex social etiquette that starts to develop around the differences of race um if you were African-American, the expectation was you would look down. If there was a white person in front of you, you wouldn't meet their gaze. Uh, you might cross the street uh, so you wouldn't bump into people. And there was the idea of the lost cause that comes into existence during this time of the Confederacy. like. Oh, they were fighting for a lost cause. It was a romanticized thing. So even though the Civil War had been over now for a couple of decades, this romantic revivalist movement happens and takes place. Following the Civil War, following the end of slavery, we see that violence is still used to keep African Americans down and this is in the form of lynching and some of these lynch mobs would be hundreds of people who would attack assault and murder someone uh, we see that some of the more common things are that a white woman's sensibilities had been tarnished there was the interracial fear of romantic relations going on and whether it was consensual or not. The problem is that crowds were infinitely, instantly willing to go to violence to, to do this. And about 100 African Americans a year are being lynched from 1890 to 1910. And that's the guesstimate number. It could actually have been much higher. Ida B. Wells, uh, depicted here, she was a journalist 
who went and led this crusade against lynching. At first, she starts documenting and reporting that it's happening and publishes her work in the North in the rest of the nation because there's some people who say, oh, this can't really be happening. Oh, it's not really that bad. And lo and behold, yeah, it is that bad. As far as public education goes, uh, it really kind of slowly stops following Reconstruction. Uh, some private foundations, some church groups are going to continue to support African-American schools, but the Freedmen's Bureau's role starts to disappear pretty quickly. One man really takes a different approach towards education, and that's Booker T. Washington. And his idea is vocational training, uh, trade schools, Tuskegee Institute, uh, the Hampton Institute. These were designed to teach skills, trades, uh, carpentry, plumbing, masonry, that kind of stuff. Washington had been born a slave in Louisiana. He learned to he learned how to read. He learned how to um, be by teaching himself uh, while he was a janitor. He gets some financial support, and he in, and he creates the Tuskegee Institute that said African Americans would raise themselves up and you know get accustomed to racism, and that over time. White, white people would reach out to African-Americans. That was the heart of the Atlantic Compromise, the idea that don't fight segregation, don't fight being a second-class citizen, learn a skill, and over time, things would get better. It's important to point out that it's not just going to be white and black people who are seeing the segregation. Segregation would also expand to include uh, people of Asian descent as well. And in fact, in Mississippi, if you were Chinese or even from East Asia, and during this time, if you were just from East Asia, you were labeled as Chinese as the easier of the two concepts. Um, you might work in different, in the same field, but be educated in different school systems. In California, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans are educated right beside white students. But if you were Chinese, you had to have a different school. In Texas and California, Mexicans legally were considered white, but they found themselves barred from restaurants, from entertainment venues, from theaters, from all these different things. So segregation was a lot of different things. Okay, moving on. Immigration, people coming here from the from other places. Uh, between 1865, the end of the Civil War, 1914, the start of World War I, about 25 million foreigners entered the United States. And most of the reasons for this is that steamship travel becomes way faster, making it also way cheaper. And there's a lot of reasons people are going to come here. They hear about jobs in the factories. They hear about unions. They hear about opportunities. They hear about land. They hear about, or they are pushed off their land, or, oh, no, there's a war, or, oh, golly, my country doesn't exist anymore. And for people who made the Atlantic crossing, the common place we hear it referred to is steerage class. It is the absolute cheapest way to get from Western Europe, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe to here, to the Americas. Uh, the conditions were cramped. It was poor food. If any food, it was usually better to bring your own stuff. Uh, and when you would arrive from West, from Europe, essentially, in the Americas, for a lot of people, their first 
station within the United States was Ellis Island in New York City. This was a big transitional place for a lot of people. Uh, and there was a lot of fears that these new immigrants were going to bring stuff to the country. Uh, there was health concerns. There was if a person was sane or not, that's why they couldn't come in. If they had any kind of criminal record, if they had anything that might differentiate them. In some cases, we see immigration tests that were designed to keep people out as well. And just like Ellis Island was on the East Coast, Angel Island is going to be on the West Coast. And this was for San Francisco, which dealt with people coming here from a predominantly Asia and saw a lot of the same things. A lot of our immigrant peoples who come here are going to live in ethnic neighborhoods. So you've got uh, French Quarter, German Quarter, Slovakian Quarters, those kind of things. Life is really hard. People are living in tenements, which are slums, and in some cases just shacks. Uh, it is the roughest part of town that they're going to live in. There's usually no running water. The crime is very bad. And then comes along a photojournalist. His name is Jacob Reese. And he uses a camera and this new explosive powder to generate light at night, what we would now call a flash photography. And he takes pictures of how bad things are and shows it to the world uh, in a book that's called How the Other Half Lives. And in it, it really does show how cramped they are. You can see in this picture, all these people just crammed together, sitting to sleep because there's no more beds anywhere. A family of seven living in a one room apartment. In 1870, we see that one in, out of three industrial workers was not born in the United States. By the early 20th century, that number had increased to half. And we see that there's actually laws barring some persons from entering this country. Um, people of Chinese descent were banned on the West Coast. Criminals, persons labeled mentally ill were not allowed to enter the nation. And being labeled mentally ill didn't necessarily mean you had a problem. In some cases, you could just show up speaking Lithuanian and there's no one there who knows what you're saying. And they just say, oh, well, he's crazy. A lot of older Americans, which meant that they had been in the United States for longer, this might still be that they were immigrants or sons of and daughters of immigrants, uh, believed that these new immigrants were going to show up and spread diseases like cholera. Um, they were highly nationalistic. They were highly xenophobic. And a lot of these people who had drunk the Kool-Aid of social Darwinism, believed that there was a racial purity that they needed to adhere to and that all these new people showing up was going to radically change everything. Some laws that start being passed, uh, 1882 said that if you were a convict, if you were a pauper, which means you're poor, if you're mentally disabled, you had to pay an extra tax to come into this country. Uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was exactly that. Uh, if you were of Chinese descent, which was, again, East Asia, you were not allowed in. And while President Roosevelt made a gentleman's agreement, so it was never like documented as legislation that said that Japanese individuals would not be allowed in. The women's movement, and this is gonna be our last big topic for this part, was really in the dynamic field of change because, well, 
we see that some of the old ideas of what a woman could be, should be, do be, was starting to change. Women are starting slowly to grow beyond the idea of just a social club, just a reform group, and starting on larger public affairs. The feminist movement begins to develop very slowly, but women are still going to be marginalized in this country. It didn't matter if they were white, black, Mexican, American, Asian, it didn't matter. We see that there's a lot of different ways that a lot of different groups are treated. So today we saw and took a look at minority groups and the way they were impacted in the United States. Hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.